So first off, proper introduction. Michelle Dowd is a journalism professor and contributor to the New York Times, the Los Angeles Book Review, The Alpinist, or Alpinist, I don't know, uh, Catapult, and other national publications. She is faculty, faculty lecturer of the year for 2022 at Chafee College, where she founded the award-winning literary journal, yes, um, the, where she founded the award-winning literary journal and creative collective, The Chafee Review, advises student media and teaches poetry and critical thinking in the, you don't even hear, you don't often hear those two together, poetry and critical <laughs> thinking, but, um, in the California Institute for Men and Women in Chino. She, yep, she has been recognized as a Long Reads Top 5 for her article on the relationship between environmentalism and hope in the Alpinist, nominated twice for the Pushcart Prize, and profiled on the second season of Sincerely X, a TED production for stories too risky, painful, or controversial to be shared on the stage. Her popular Modern Love column in the New York Times inspired a book contract. Michelle was raised on a mountain in the Angeles National Forest, where she learned to identify flora and fauna, navigate by the stars, forage for edible plants, and care for the earth. As an experienced registered yoga teacher, she has been teaching students and training teachers in Southern California studios since 2008, as well as teaching yoga to employees at local businesses and leading yoga on tap at Claremont Craft Ales. Yes! <laughs> Michelle's first book, Forager, Field Notes on Surviving a Family Cult, a memoir uh, published by Algonquin Press, showcases her life growing up on an isolated mountain in California as part of an apocalyptic cult and how she found her way out of poverty and illness by drawing on the gifts of the wilderness. So welcome, oh, and I forgot to mention Pitzer alum, hello. Uh, the most important, <laughs> the most important thing a sage hen. Um, hi, Michelle. Hi, Phil. I'm so good to see you again. I am so happy you're here, so happy to be sitting next to you, and so honored that I was asked to do this, and honored that you signed my book so beautifully <laughs> and warmly. I'll just tell you quickly, um, I got a copy of the book, and then we I had to go to Arizona to be with the in-laws for a weekend. <laughs> and uh, this was my salvation. Um, I just read it straight through, I think, in two days. Um, it was really nice. I don't often get to have that experience. Um, th that said, those of you who have read it know, it's to say it's a gripping read is an understatement. Um, it's gripping, it's captivating, but it's also quite harrowing, quite sad. I think I cried, if I recall. There's times where it's very devastating. And so it's this incredible and... I just have to say, I think I wrote this to you, but it's just so beautifully, and despite the heroiness of it and the often tragic and traumatic aspects, it's so beautifully written. I was just in it. And so congratulations on that. You've written an amazing, amazing piece of work here. Um, so I'll just start. My first question is, what, prompt, what prompted you to write this book? I mean, was it just the time was right or was there a trigger or... What, what was the background for finally sitting down and telling us your story? Well, there's more than one true answer to that question. Um, the simplest version is that after the Modern Love column, I had agents calling me and saying, you have a book in you, right? And I thought, I guess I do. And so um, I signed with an agent and then wrote the book. So it really wasn't until I had someone who believed in me um, and was willing to put a little bit of money behind it. It felt like I was trapped into a contract that I felt like I could sit down and just write it. Um, but that being said, it was my mom was also on hospice. And I think if I had not believed that she would pass before the book came out, it would have been difficult for me to write. I was also able, while she was on hospice, to ask her a lot of questions about her experience with plants. And so it gave me kind of an inroad into what I would consider a healthy conversation with her because we had had... Um, difficulty uh, communicating with each other for many, many years. And talking about plants as she was dying was uh, really a wonderful way to connect with her. Oh, absolutely. And I had the motivation to do so because I wanted to make sure that I was accurately portraying um, that aspect of her because she she hid it quite a bit. She was a little secretive, mm -hmm. um, as am I. But <laughs> um, she, she had a lot of things that she kept very private, um, both during the years that she was raising me and after that. 
well, I, I even, I think I recall, if I remember correctly, even you didn't even know how, what an expert she was as a naturalist. And you sort of discovered that later on when someone was like, oh, that's your mom. And she, you know, and that wasn't even so, so yeah. Okay, but so thank you for that. So if I got it right, you, <clears throat> you were, you know, okay, you were writing, you were out there, you were writing these columns, agents came to you, hey, I think you've got a book in you. But I mean, you weren't writing a book about yoga or modern love, or I mean, this is your story and it's your childhood and it's your family. So was there a feeling like you had kind of been, I guess I'm wondering if this was just bursting at the seams and it just was, and then once you had the permission, you let it out, or was a lot of this kind of deeply buried and it was a sort of process of excavation? Both and. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I had been um, for about four or five years prior playing around with writing stories about my family that I started going public with probably uh, through a blog that my good friend Angela started called wewillbeginagain.com. And we were um, blogging together. Uh, she later took down the blog, which was great because uh, then I had a chance to like step away from the stories. But um, I didn't really start even applying for any paid publications until probably 2019. Mm. Like it was really late in my life because I um, I was teaching and I was raising children and I just felt like my job was to help other people find their stories. Mm. And it just didn't feel very relevant to talk about mine. Plus, I think I was a little fearful about my family of origin, which is not just my biological family, but all the people I come from. I was a little afraid of their anger. And um, I just was uncomfortable talking about it. Mm. So I think the combination of my mom's, because I did sign before COVID hit. So mm. it I did write it during COVID, but I signed in 2020 right before. <laughs> I think I signed like on March 3rd. Oh my goodness. <laughs> wow. So, um, and then, yeah. Um, but I do feel that it it really was a bit of an impetus knowing that my mom, she had been yeah. sick for quite some time prior yeah. to being put on hospice. But when she was on hospice, I really felt like it would be, I didn't have very much more time to explore this and I was maybe a little bit worried that if I waited till afterwards, mm -hmm. um, I don't know, I wasn't sure that I would be able to find, I, it wasn't even just the words, but sort of the motivation mm -hmm. to write it. Mm -hmm. But I did write the whole book cover to cover in four months. Wow. And wow. that, so it really did just come out of me Pour once I out. sat down. I had structured what I wanted to do wow. prior to that. Um, but I sat and I wrote it by candlelight in the early, early morning before it became light. So I was still teaching, um, but I was teaching online during COVID. And I would just get up and I would light a candle because it made me feel like I could enter a you know, more spiritual place, I think. And I just channeled the voice and the spirit, I think, of the girl who really, truly, honestly, never spoke publicly about anything. I mean, you know, she just, everything that she said, I think, during those years was just hushed. And then when I came to Pitzer, I didn't want to talk about it. I just wanted to learn what was going on in the real world. Mm -hmm. And so Which I- Which is Pitzer, of course. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I mean, Pitzer opened me up to so many wonderful opportunities. And the last thing I wanted to do in those days was look back at all, mm. so. Well, that was actually like one of the last questions, but since we're here, can you, t I, you know, can you tell us a bit about coming to Pitzer and what those, that first year was like, or, you know, what, or even just the whole time you were here, what really, uh, I would love to hear the highlights, lowlights, and just kind of how one goes from your background to Pitzer College, where, you know. Seamlessly. <laughs> I mean, we don't, you know. Yeah. Well, uh, I did not mention the college in the book because I didn't want to call them out, but since we're all friends here, I am going to call out. <laughs> I didn't apply to Pitzer College, I actually applied to Pomona. And uh, it was the only college I was house cleaning, and um, a woman said, "Here's a you know application to Pomona College." Yeah. I had never been to Claremont or to Pomona College, but I put in the application. But I literally filled it out in pencil and wrote a poem for my statement of purpose. And um, an admissions officer probably laughed and said, "Oh, what a funny little girl! <laughs> She's not coming here. <laughs> We're serious over here. We'll send this application over to Pitzer." So um, I got an acceptance letter from Pitzer without applying. That wow. is a fact. <laughs> oh, I love it. And then it. Um, I came here for a visit, and there were a lot of barefoot people. And I oh, sat in yeah. on a class. So when I first got here, I went to a cl class in Scott Hall, and um, it was just a seminar. And I just sat in the back, and I thought there were girls wearing T-shirts and boxer shorts and barefoot. 
And it just felt free. You know, it felt like that whatever was expected in academic institutions, some of these people weren't taking it that seriously. That was my perception at the time. Yeah. And so I just felt like, oh, okay, I could like, you know, blend in here. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't, it wasn't that I was allowed to dress that way. It was just very appealing to think that that was possible. Mm -hmm. So um, I did move in when I was 17 and it was a huge shock, huge shock. I mean, it shocked everything about my understanding of the world. <laughs> Um, and so it took me some time to figure out. You moved into the dorms? I did. I moved into Holden, into Holden. which has since been decimated. But yes. Yes. And my roommate was Mormon and she oh, wow. was very strict Mormon. So neither of us had ever. And I both of us graduated from college without ever tasting alcohol without. I did not dive into party culture. I dove into academia. So yeah. when I got here, all I cared about was reading books and yeah. learning. And I became closer friends with professors than other students because I really didn't have anything in common with other students. I didn't know the music. I didn't know television. I didn't know the kinds of things that people, you know, just culturally bond over. Mm. And I also had never um, really heard swear words and I hadn't. Um, you won't hear any from me. Just so you know. <laughs> You'll probably hear some from me. <laughs> um, but there was a lot of things I was unfamiliar with and it really made it mm. difficult to, to know how friendship even like that friendship dance that, yeah. you know, it's sort of natural to some people. The people I knew I was raised with since I was born. So we never did that. I didn't meet people. Mm -hmm. You know, there was there was strangers who were outsiders. And I wasn't like the things I did, like when I cleaned for somebody, I was polite, but there was a lot of armor. Mm -hmm. And um, so I just wore my armor all the time here for most of the time. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Um, so <laughs> on a weekend, what did you do? Well, um, I got married very young. <laughs> and so While I- While you were still at Pitts. Uh -huh, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. And I married someone who had um, left the field. Um, oh, he was older than me and he had left um, largely because of what he saw me going through when I was just turning 18. Oh, wow. So, but I'd known him my whole life mm -hmm. um, since I was two years old. So mm -hmm. um, I was doing that kind of thing. I was working okay. a lot too. I was okay. house cleaning. I had, I didn't want to take out loans because I was so afraid okay. of getting trapped. And so I just worked all the time. Gotcha. I worked multiple jobs. And so you were extremely busy and you had a lot going on. <laughs> well, I mean, I was running away too. And I was deeply, deeply committed to everything I was learning here, but I also had to support myself. Absolutely. And what did you major in? I majored in English and world literatures. Any, any favorite professors or classes that you recall? Oh yeah. I remember all my classes, quite honestly. Um, one of my favorite very first classes I took, which was not in my discipline because I didn't know what I was majoring in when I came here, I took um, a, a world history through religions course oh, wow. with Alan Greenberger. Oh, wow. And he was amazing. Oh, man. Was it Greenberger or Greenberg? Before my time, actually. Okay. Ooh. Well, he passed not too long to ago. I got a note about that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, he was, he was older even when I was here. Yeah. And I also took from, um, well, I didn't, my first advisor was Glass, Professor Glass. Oh, yeah who I heard is going to be around this weekend. I doubt he's I here today. I wouldn't be surprised. But he was my freshman advisor. Yeah. And what he told me is, you just need to open his catalog and look for things that excite you. And that's what you should take. Oh, I love it. And that was just such a puzzling. But I said, but what am I supposed to take? He said, oh, there's no supposed to. Do whatever you want. Like, what moves you? And I was like, I don't know. You know, so he, I, we, I sat in his office and he was just like, no, just go through the catalog, look at the things and tell me why you like them. Wow. So I took theater and music appreciation and dance and, you know, psychology. So I didn't start in mm -hmm. my major. I just started playing and I just, I don't think I could have ever gone mm. to anywhere that would have given me the kind of education I got here. Oh, I love to hear that. Yeah. Let's just sit and enjoy that I know. for a while. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me go for a couple more and then we'll open it up here. Okay. What... Since I, I don't, okay. I guess I am curious um, on the effect it had on your siblings. And obviously those would be your bi immediate biological siblings, but given the nature of the field, you're, you really did have an extended family. Yes. Um, so how, how has it been? Are they condemning you? Are they praising you? Is it neutral? Like, give us some of the details here. Nothing about this experience has been neutral. Okay. <laughs> Nothing. Um, so I have three biological siblings, and my younger two siblings came for all the opening stuff, like right before the book opened, and okay. they were there on opening day. It has been wonderful with my brother. 
Um, we have always maintained a relationship, but it has been distant because everyone in our family scattered, basically, mm. like really early on. Mm. And my my brother never went to college. He hasn't read a book since his early teenage years. And he read this book in one night. It showed up in the mail. And I did not give it to my siblings early. I was a little nervous about it. I met with all of them to verify stories and things as I was mm-hmm. writing it. But I don't think that when I was talking to them about it, they maybe understood that this book was really going public in the way that it mm-hmm. is. Um, and, and I mean, I guess I didn't completely know how public it would be, but I was honest that I was writing something. Um, but there was also an aspect with my brother that he said out loud is, first of all, that's the first book he had read since he was an early teen. And second, he said, you gave me a way of understanding myself. Mm. And I think that was probably worth writing the book just to hear him say that. Absolutely. So he read it um, in one night and then he showed up the next morning at my house. So not the morning, but like later in the morning mm-hmm. for him. <laughs> and he showed up and then he came to the events and he was just so wonderful. And he um, had his friends read it so that they would have uh-huh. some idea where he came from because he said he'd never spoken to any of his friends ever about how he was raised. Wow. And he said for the first time... Um, and I went to his birthday party recently, and he said to all his friends, this is my sister, and um, she and I were raised in a cult together. So that was a big step. Wow. My younger sister moved to the East Coast. She came to Pomona College, actually. Okay. So while she was still in the cult, I drove uh, down to the field and said, you need to get in my car. <laughs> and I drove her here to the current colleges and showed her around. And she's two years younger than I am. So she, the four of us are within four, uh, five years of each other, mm-hmm. all of us. And I brought her here and she said, oh, well, I'm going to go to the good school. And, <laughs> <laughs> and she studied really hard and took the SATs wow. and, and got in. And so she and I were both here at the Climate Colleges together for a couple it. years. And then she went to the East Coast. She got um, recruited into insurance and she did not want to be poor as I did not either. But I think worse than being poor was like having to wear a suit. That was the scariest thing in the whole entire world. And she did have to wear one. So... <laughs> Um, but she she has done very well on the East Coast and she's had a family out there. So she flew out. And um, I think it was a little more challenging for her in some ways because she's a bigger part of the story mm. than my brother is. Mm-hmm. And we were very close as teenagers mm. and we became distant afterwards. But there's like these huge pockets of time where she's been deeply in my life. Mm. And so I think her like the fact that her story was told when she hadn't even told her husband mm. the things that it went on in the story. It, that was, I mean, she, she's been wonderful toward me. She hasn't judged that I chose to do that, but I think it was just challenging for her. Yeah. And then our older sister hasn't spoken to me. So she's, um, she runs, she kind of took over for our mom and she runs, um, oh, well, wow. she runs the school from kindergarten through sixth grade at the field. Okay. And she's been telling me for years when we do talk that it has changed there and it's completely different than how we were raised. And that is true to the extent that I, it is our grandfather's dead and there's not that extreme rigidity, but there's still not a single person who's ever been able to come out as gay there. There's never, I mean, they, they have actually put, you know, young people through extreme programming to try Mm. to deprogram, Mm. you know, their sexuality. And they also are very rigid about never speaking to people who are excommunicated and things like that. So um, a lot of people have come out of the woodworks who I would consider Mm earlier family of mine, um, people who knew me, knew my parents before I was born, who knew my mom when she was pregnant with me, people who babysat me when I was one or two or three years old. And they've all been writing on different social media platforms, including LinkedIn, like just all these strange places, finding me, my work account. Wow. And so I get letters every day wow. from people who um, grew up at the field and also people who grew up at the field after I left, wow. whose parents I knew. And they've shown up every event that I've done, probably including today. How many of you, um, just, just raise your hand if you went to the fields ever? Okay, so there's a few in here. There's, I was going to say there's always some. <laughs> okay, um, yeah, and everyone had a different experience, of wow. course. And so I, I try to say this, and I want to say it again, is I don't speak for everyone's experience. Every decade was very different there. And um, I think my grandfather probably was more extreme at the end of his life mm. in terms of... Um, how mercurial he was and how violent he was. And I didn't know him when he was young and I didn't know how charismatic mm. he was. Um, and I think that there were times probably that it wasn't that unhealthy at the beginning and before it turned really restrictive. It's hard to know. Mm. I've done some research and um, I've heard so many stories. I'm thinking about doing kind of like an olive 
Kittredge style compendium of, mm -hmm. you know, different ways of relating mm -hmm. to the field. But we'll see. Thank you for that. That's All a right. lot of information. Sorry oh, about that. One long more, time. if you'll, if the audience will let me. One more. Um, I have so many questions, but I don't want to abuse the podium here. Um, okay, um, I, as a social scientist, I'm a, I'm a professor of sociology and secular studies, and I study religion. And you probably know that terminology is always a big deal, and even the term religion. What does it mean? I think most religious studies departments, you know, exist to just debate what religion is. <laughs> <laughs> um, but where I was taught and I understand that there's a big debate about certain terms because they can be seen as pejorative or um, they're not necessarily value free or value neutral. And one of those classic uh, words is cult. Um, you know, that we're told that as social scientists, we shouldn't use that term because it's, there's problems, you know, but, but I noticed that, and I struggle with it. Sometimes I use it, sometimes I don't. Um, and I, you know, and, and for various, in various contexts, but I noticed that you use it not only, you know, as the subtitle of your book, but tonight, you know, you, you used it without flinching, just boom, 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 several times. So I'm just going to put you on the spot and say, wh wh why do you use the term cult? Why is it useful? Why would you say the field was a cult? And what, what, what tell us a little bit about that. So. I'm going to answer this question slightly backwards by saying I did not choose to put it on the cover of my book. I named this book Forger Field Notes on Survival. Right. And then we played around being, meaning there was a team of people at Algonquin and Hachette who played around. And we even had Field Notes on Surviving the End of the World, a okay. bunch of different things. And they all wanted the word cult. It's and a seller. It is, right? But I was really resistant. And so my ability to throw that word, to bandy it about... Um, really comes from uh, the gift they gave me <laughs> of forcing. And I mean, mm -hmm. technically the subtitle is considered part of cover design mm -hmm. and it was their call. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I didn't throw so big of a stink that I was, I mean, I threw a bit of a stink, but I didn't throw a tantrum. Um, I just said, I don't want that title. Mm -hmm. I don't, like that, I feel is a misleading mm -hmm. in the sense of I don't really teach people how to survive a cult, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. And I and I do think the book is not about surviving Mm, I think it is though. And that's the thing. I think they're right, honestly. Mm -hmm. But I think we all could, yeah, I'm going to just like turn that on its head for a second and say that I think there's a lot of definitions of cult that are bandied about today that are much more minor in the sense of who has control in any given situation. Mm -hmm. And I think families have aspects. Mm -hmm. Many families have aspects of cult mentality in the mm -hmm. sense of there's secrecy. Um, there's somebody in control that everyone's protecting. Mm -hmm. There's some codependency, mm -hmm. all of that. But the larger definition of cult, I had a sociology professor, Al, um, mm. who, Joe Benton was my professor in English World Literatures. Okay. And, right. <laughs> do you, and Al Schwartz was it? Uh-huh. Yeah. Do you know Al Schwartz? Yeah. Of course. Okay. So he told me when I was 18 that I was raised in a cult. And I said, no, I wasn't. I was told it's not a cult. He said, well, let me just, <laughs> <laughs> he said, let me give you a book. And um, it's going to tell you why everything that I have asked you is completely included here. I'm like so excited to talk to you about this. I said, I don't want to talk about it. We had that conversation many times. I was always mm. at their house. Oh, wow. And he said, um, this, this is fascinating because so many cults aren't successful. And like, what an amazing thing that yeah. your grandfather was successful yeah. at this. Um, and he made it seem like, you know, that I came from royalty or something, you know, this <laughs> fun cult. Um, but the thing about the cult was that when you think about how there's there's more than one definition, but one of the main ones is that there is a charismatic leader. And even if that charismatic leader is dead, Mm -hmm. um, there is somebody that people are still relying on for the um, authority mm -hmm. and that authority. I mean, I know that people rely on quote God as the authority, but God in the Bible is told through so many different viewpoints, right? There's mm -hmm. so many, you know, these are 66 books and there's the, you know, Old Testament, and the New Testament and so many different um, generations that they were well, not more than, you know, thousands of years difference between some of the books. So um, you get some human who comes and says, but I know because mm. God has told me what it really means. Mm. And then they can say anything after that. And people have to not only obey, but that there'll be the whole group then punishes people who don't. 
And that's one of the main yeah. things and that people have to give up identities outside of the cult, mm -hmm. um, that there's a great deal of secrecy mm -hmm. that goes on. There's secret rituals. Usually in cults, very little is written down mm -hmm. or the things that are written down are for the public performance um, mm -hmm. of outsiders, but not for the people who are on the inside. Mm -hmm. And sometimes in cults, and this is true, I think, in Scientology or in Nexium or something, there's this whole circle of of the beginnings of like being welcomed into a community. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's fairly benign and, and people feel special because they belong to it. And it's not until you like work your way through the circular layers that you get down to the center of where it's really damaging. Mm -hmm. And this is a story that I've heard over and over. And if you, you know, if you watch documentary like um, Under the Banner of Heaven, or you've read the book that John Krakauer you know, investigated, or you watch Waco, which mm -hmm. I strongly recommend. You know, those those the people who get into the very, very inside, they don't know what they're getting into mm -hmm. until they go through kind of a series of tests. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, if you meet the full definition of a cult, there are always rituals and tests that outsiders are not aware of and that outsiders are not subjected to. Mm -hmm. And then if you pass those tests, then you get access, you get like a key to the inner sanctum. And then once you're there, you're threatened with losing everything um, if you even talk about it. Mm -hmm. And then you are another um, main criteria of a cult is that if you speak about it afterwards, everyone will call you a liar who was inside the cult. And that is completely still true at the field is that the people who left and they contact me and they say, just so you know, this happened to me, this happened to me, it's the same stuff. Mm -hmm. But the people who are inside said, no, that's never happened. And, you know, it's really easier in life to um, go along with the system than it is to defend the people that that system hurts. Mm. And there are plenty of people inside that it hasn't hurt. Because if you stay, mm. you it's possible. And I think my sister's had this experience. She has never been alienated. Mm. She spent her whole life mm. doing what they asked her to do. And she has a pretty good life. Mm. Her life is not tortuous. You know, mm. she really believes in what she does. She has a sense of purpose. Mm -hmm. She has a community. Mm -hmm. She has children, a husband who I grew up with, you know, that we've always known. And so it's the people who can't, for some reason, perform mm -hmm. whatever the cult needs you to perform or question or, or are upset at the way that other people are treated. Those people are the ones who suffer, not mm -hmm. the people who are able mm -hmm. to perform, you know, that, yeah. Thank you for that. That was, man. <laughs> and that was, that was really good. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. All right. I have many more questions. But let's open it up. I'd love to hear. Okay, <laughs> Alexis, yeah. Hi. Um, I do have a question for this. When I was reading the book, um, it resonated a lot with me. I grew up in an abusive household. I grew up um, very religious. I grew up with lots of things. I'm also a good person. So what I thought was interesting, and I want to know kind of how you found this voice, you talk about the things that are happening in real time, some of them, right? And there's a normalcy about it, right? It doesn't feel threatening. It doesn't feel violent. It doesn't feel any of the things that we associate with it now. Um, and I feel the way that way about a lot of things. It happens to me. And so, how did you find that? Because it's written so beautifully to like make it um, probably with everybody who's kind of feeling that way about some things. How did you find that? It's unique, I think. First of all, lovely to see you, Alexis. Yeah, you um, <clears throat> the normalcy. Uh, I still have difficulty when people say this book is sad or it's difficult. I was thinking, oh, I left out the difficult parts. This is like hopeful. <laughs> I, I don't, I still sort of feel that there is nothing that extreme that went on, you know? Um, but it was very intentional to use a first person voice and a real time voice. And if um, you're familiar with like structure, many of you in here, you might notice that the voice changes a little as she gets a little bit older. So it's told in a kind of a choppy, very intentionally like, really um, immature voice at the beginning because she doesn't have the language to talk about what's really happening to her. And then it starts developing further, but at no time other than, you know, the intro and the epilogue, is there a sophisticated voice that's analyzing anybody's intentions? And my reason for doing that is because my perspective while I was going through it, um, I didn't think it was unusual. That was my life. And also that I still to this day, no matter how many people tell me things on the outside, I don't really know what anybody else was truly thinking um, as they were going through it. And it felt like trying to enter in any other direction, like from an adult or an educated perspective takes away the experience that that girl was having because she wasn't educated and she wasn't, she had, didn't have the language. And I think um, a lot of this, when I was thinking about foraging, I was thinking about where did I find hope and where did I find sustenance? A lot of that is in language. 
and it's in the ability to name things. Mm -hmm. And I feel like someone handing me the word cults when I was 18 was mm -hmm. really useful, even though I pushed it out of my, mm -hmm. you know, dialogue at the time, it was still embedded somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, and I was able to come out with it later. But at the time, I didn't think I was being raised in a cult. I thought I was being raised in a righteous community that knew more than the rest of the world knew. And um, it was a little risky, I think, to tell the story that way. I think there was a little bit of resistance. But my editor did tell me early on, um, oh, yeah, you need to show me anything. Just write the whole book and just give it to me when you're done. And so when I did that, we, from the time I handed her that first draft, we didn't take out any chapters. Mm. We didn't add anything except for the epilogue because mm. she said, oh, now I get it. So I felt that it was um, the only way Amazing. that I could... Um, I could I could show what it was like to be in it rather than talk about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there are many, many, many people who maybe wouldn't call their upbringing a cult, but they absolutely were raised in a lot of rigidity. A lot of a lot of girls were raised in purity culture. Um, I know boys were raised that way, too, but particularly girls were indoctrinated to feel shame about it. Mm -hmm. And I have heard from so many of them and I heard about them before I wrote the book, too. But it is so common in this country. Anybody in the back? Yeah, right here. Yeah. Well, um, I, I'm just curious to hear more about your relationship with your mom. I know it was troubled, but I, I believe I've also heard you speculate about thinking maybe she was cautious or not trying to be equal to actually mistake. But I'm just, I'm just kind of curious about that and the legacies, good and bad, that your mom has in your life. So it's a beautiful book, by the way. Thank you. Um, Patrick and Alexis are both Pitzer grads as well, and I think you, I don't know, Patrick, did you take a class from I've, Professor Zuckerman? Yeah, um, I sat in when Alexis was a student. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I've, read, I've read your books. I knew I liked you. <laughs> <laughs> My mom um, is a complicated character in the book, but she was also just a complicated person. Um, I, I don't know what my mom was consciously doing or not doing, um, but... She did not like being a mother. And even at the end of her life, she couldn't even remember when we were kids. Um, my, and not because she had memory problems. She could tell you everything about the plants. But it, she just had a difficult time, really. She, she sort of handed over her babies when they were very young. And my dad, too, said, oh, I don't remember anything about your childhood. And I said, oh, yeah, probably because mom was doing it. He said, mom wasn't doing it. Mom was like on the road. And so I think that um, there was just a lot of times she wasn't around. And I really craved her attention. So I, I paid a lot of attention to her, even as she wasn't paying attention to me. Um, but I think my mom was truly curious about everything. And I, I feel that she was a victim of her father's authority. Um, and because girls were not respected where I come from, um, she had to very masculinize her, every aspect of her being. She looked very masculine, but she also had to maybe not had to, she chose to, whatever, it, it was a survival technique of hers um, to become more masculine than her three older brothers, you know, and my other cousins who come from her brothers will say, oh yeah, your mom was definitely the toughest, like she was by far, you know, and she was my grandfather's star, um, even though she was female. So um, mm -hmm. I think she worked really, really hard to impress him. And so she developed her very rational mind and she pushed away those nurturing sides of her. Um, she also didn't like me at all when I was a kid, and I don't blame her for that. I think I was a really difficult kid for what she was trying to do in her life. And um, it was probably very annoying to have a kid who kept asking you questions when you really, really, really didn't have answers to those questions. And um, I think that she also knew on some level, and my younger sister will say this too, uh, that there wasn't enough room for all of us at the cult. Like she had three daughters before she had a son. And I don't think, I think she could only groom one mm. to really take over. And that's exactly what happened is that our older sister took over for our mother. And for many years, they worked side by side. And our older sister will also say she had no relationship with our mother. Um, my, our mother really didn't want a relationship with her children. And um, at her death, they wrote an obituary at the field. And um, we all showed up for her service. And the obituary didn't mention she had children or grandchildren <laughs> or a great grandchild. Um, it literally just didn't mention it. Mm. And um, they they published in their, you know, interleaguer stuff and all the published stuff they put about 
you know, her passing and the sadness of her passing did not mention her children. And I just think it wasn't a part of her identity. Mm. Now, of course, I rewrote the obituary and <laughs> threw in that she did have uh, children. Um, and and we printed it ourselves and we passed it out. So <laughs> um, it, did, it did get out there. But I don't know that she was ashamed of us. I just don't think she thought it was an important part of her life. Mm. You know, it's just something she did one day, like for five years, she did that thing. And then like, that was a mistake, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> so she moved on. We, we have a few questions that came in back here. Um, okay. The first one, um, what do you think should be the role of government social workers in protecting kids in such situations? Ooh. So that's a big question, obviously. Um, one of the problems with anyone's ability to protect kids in these situations is that these organizations only succeed if they are extremely secretive. So it is really difficult to infiltrate these systems. And I brought up Waco. Um, I just think it's an easy way to access the information to watch the, um, not the documentary, but the um, reenactment of Waco. It's just that it's, I truly believe had there been a siege when I was young, they would have fought off people and, and they wouldn't have necessarily, I wouldn't say they didn't care if their kids died, but they would have thought that it was better for their children to die um, in the kingdom of God than to be taken and raised by outsiders. And so you always run a risk when you have, when you, obviously I think that these children should be protected and it's happening all over. You know, um, there's, you know, tons of sex trafficking happening in this, in these cults too. And they're being married off to older men and all the things that are happening. But, you know, using force to come into these communities often has disastrous results and for the very children you're trying to rescue. And so it's a really hard thing to identify these places. And then once you identify, I mean, the children have all been, I don't love this term, but I'm going to use it, brainwashed. And so they're not also going to tell you the truth. I didn't tell the truth. And even in the context of the psychologist who was asking me when I was 16, certainly old enough to tell the truth, I didn't. I lied. Because you lie to protect the people that you've been taught your whole life. You've been given a script. And so the role that I would hope that, you know, social workers and law enforcement, I would hope that they could, you know, take children out of these situations and raise them other places. But I think the reality of doing that is really complicated. Mm. Um, I'm actually going to work with, I mean, it's just sh short, but um, working with law enforcement who are looking at, you know, being trained for special ops units for cults. Oh, wow. And so I'm just doing an online program with a um, retired police officer who has investigated cults for his entire career. And he's like in his seventies now. And I'm just doing, you know, some appearances online, um, as a special guest. And I think that it's probably useful to find people who have mm. chosen to leave at whatever point, but also ones who have been removed because many of them have turned violent because it's a really, really difficult Steve Hassan, um, Dr. Steve Hassan, is that how you pronounce his last name? He is considered a, you know, a renowned cult expert and the work that he's doing right now in deprogramming comes from people who have left these situations, but, you know, they're already out. So okay. it's a whole different form of deprogramming. That's yeah. So interesting. Another from the QR? Yes, machine. we have another one. Um, as you wrote the book, did in, any memories you had forgot about from childhood come up? And how was it to re relive these experiences through the writing process? I think it, that the writing process was incredibly nurturing because I was in control of it. <laughs> like I was creating a safe space um, to have these memories. But I was dreaming constantly, and I've been having nightmares um, about certain aspects of my childhood my whole life. Mm. I have had gone through periods of time where I scream um, uncontrollably at night, like those night terrors that you can hear yourself screaming, but you can't make yourself stop because your body's doing something that your mind can't control. So I think the writing of it felt so much safer than the sort of intermittent mm. memories, the triggers that would come across um, during my lifetime. I have, I have done work with cognitive therapy and a lot of somatic therapy, or I don't think I would have been able to write the book mm. in a way that um, wasn't self-harming. And by the time that I wrote the book, which is much later in life, I was able to write it without um, breaking down during the writing process. And, you know, I've been teaching writing for a long time, and I do think it requires some degree of distance to be able to, to capture the emotions I think when you're having the emotions, they're too raw. Mm. 
and if you were going to capture them for a reader, and, and the book is written for an audience, so it's not written as catharsis. It's not written as my journal. And I did very fortunately have access to hundreds and hundreds of pages, uh, mostly not actual books that were journals, but just tons of pages of writing that I did as a little girl um, and as a teenager that I had literally put in a box and put a lock on it and carried that box around to all the different places that um, my husband and I and our children moved over the years and then didn't unlock it until I went to go talk at TED it was the first time I unlocked it. So I had access to the actual voice of the little girl. So it was easier, I think, mm. to go back there because I had her voice with me. Wow. And I have the actual original Sears catalog. I was going to ask about that. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. And it is, that, it's like, it's like a Bible. It's like the, as you know, you got capitalism and you got religion, this monoliths and um, yeah, man. I thought it worked great as symbolism as well. Oh my goodness. Great I, questions, by the way. You guys are a wonderful audience. Um, great. Wait, oh, yep. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Hi. You mentioned your grandfather. I'd like to know a little bit of the history behind the fields and the cult and how it got started. My grandfather was um, an orphan who came from Oklahoma to Southern California in the 1920s. There is some discrepancy of how old he was, somewhere between 12 and 16 when he arrived here. And he studied under some um, preachers, religious institutions in LA, and then started working for the Boy Scouts um, when he was probably 19. And he was running troops at the Boy Scouts. He learned a lot of his idea of how to run boys groups at through Boy Scouts. At some point in his 20s, he decided that Boy Scouts was not giving him the kind of freedom that he needed to, in my opinion, control groups of boys. But he left the Boy Scouts, possibly under suspicious circumstances. It's very difficult to tell. But by 1929... Um, that's the first newspaper articles of him taking outside groups that weren't Boy Scouts into the mountains in Los Angeles uh, National Forest. By 1931, he had named the organization. It was an all-male organization for decades. And he started to um, call boys from in after-school programs. And they were playing sports and doing um, what they called a Bible band. And so he trained them to play music and to play sports. And um, some of the members of his very first group in the early 1930s followed him up until their deaths. Um, I would say the last one probably died about seven years ago mm. and were with him, never married, were just like his followers, even after he died and took over. Um, one man who was there when I was born, not my father, he took over when my grandfather died in the 1980s and stayed there and ran the organization mm. like the direct, like, and he joined in the 1930s as a young child. Mm. So um, my grandfather's system during the 30s, 40s, and 50s, it was all male organization. When my mom was born in the 40s, she was the first girl at the organization because she had three brothers. So they were all raised, you know, in this boy's system. And then my grandfather had to think about what to do with her. So he let her hang out with the boys. And then at some point, probably when she was about 13, my grandmother decided to also allow girls to formulate into the organization. And um, after that, they had their first wedding. And I think it became more strict after that because before that, boys had to be celibate their whole, or at least um, supposedly. Uh, and they they couldn't marry, they couldn't have children. So it was the kind of apocalyptic cult that was like, they just kept thinking the world was going to end. My grandfather prophesied that it would end in 1977. And so they were all like thinking that that was the big day. And then... Spoiler alert, it didn't happen. Yeah, and so, <laughs> uh, yeah. And, and so after that, then he changed the story and he said that the, the dates were wrong and that Jesus was really born at a different time and the scholars had gotten those dates wrong. And my uncle, who I talk about in the book, he was constantly oh, doing yeah. um, interpretations of the stars to predict when Jesus was coming back. And there was just a lot of that, like this they made it seem so logical that there was a mathematical system to when, you know, God was going to destroy the world. And then there'd be a thousand years of terror. And I was going to, I was trained to be part of the army of God, possibly to lead part of like one of the troops in the army or like one of the groups in the army of God. And um, that we would, you know, survive in the rocks and the crevices of the mountain while, and you know, the world, like, I don't know, yielded to sin. It was, we, they used revelation. So the symbolism <laughs> It was like different at different times, but you know, you have the blood rises to the horse's bridles and you have all the, yeah, all the different creatures and that lion's head and the, um, 
yeah. Seven headed beast. Yes, yes. And the number 666, and but this is also open to interpretation. I feel that all of this is open to interpretation, but, but at the time I was taught that it was true. Um, very useful for poetry, by the way. A lot of absolutely. metaphor. And, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Michelle. We, um, we have a I few more. Another from the QR code. Yes. Um, one of the most tra tragic parts of your memoir was the utter lack of nurturing that you experienced. Uh, my observation is that you today are incredibly an incredibly nurturing person. Any insights as to how that happened? Um, I think. To be honest, I have, I, I've struggled from my lack of nurturing my whole life. I feel like it's still something I struggle with. And when my agent wanted me to write an inspirational book, I told her that no way am I going to write an inspiring book about like telling people that these, that you can overcome. Mm. Um, I think that we teach best what we most need to learn. And so mm. I became a teacher very young. I literally taught mm. my first college class when I was 21. And I continue to teach. I have never not been a teacher. Mm. And um, I became a mother very young. And I have um, four children that I've raised. And I just started out very young, I think, growing up with my students, growing up with my children. And in the process of nurturing, you learn how to nurture. And I think I needed it so badly that I was just, I was trying to give what I most needed. And um, that's taken me a long time to understand that. I mean, and there's boundary issues with that too, because I, I think I was just so looking, I was creating community and I didn't see it as a hierarchy because where I was raised was so hierarchical. The last thing in a million years I wanted to do was recreate that. And so I was always with my children and with um, my students, I was always creating to the best of my ability, um, non-hierarchical structures, you know, communities where multiple voices had equal weight. And I always went by my first name as a professor, which a lot of people at Pitzer do. So that was seemed common to me. Um, but all my students have always called me Michelle. And I just wanted to remove those barriers. I felt like that what I could best give was the ability to ask questions that the students would then find the answers to. And I feel like I've lived my whole life that way, asking questions that I don't know the answers to, and then discovering them with so many wonderful young people who bring in different types of wisdom. And at the time, some of the young people were older than I was, <laughs> but, you know, but we, we learned together, including, you know, my children also taught me a great deal um, as, as they had a different experience of the world than I did. Mm. <clears throat> Quick follow up on that. How do you feel your children will take this book when they and if they read it? So um, at least two and maybe three of my children have not read it. I know one of mine has read it. Um, it. They find it very painful, and it's not something that I want to push on them. Right. Um, so I don't know entirely the answer to that. I I raised my children to have respect for a variety of types of faith communities, partly so that they wouldn't boomerang and like look for something they didn't have. They all publicly identify as atheists, mm. but they were raised um, in the Clement, you know, Church of Christ mm. system and. Uh, in the church schools and in all the uh, different ways. But the the theology that they were taught there was so open and affirming mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that I felt that they had the opportunity to see community that is healthy. And I wanted them to have other adults that they trusted that were not our family. Mm -hmm. They did definitely, um, you know, trust their father and, and their wonderful, um, his sister, their wonderful aunt and, and her husband, their uncle and their cousins. And they had family here, but um, I wanted them to have a bigger community Partly because I didn't want them, yeah, to go back and and seek um, something that they felt was denied them. Mm, interesting. Thank you. Thank you. I did see one hand down here, and then we'll take another question. Here. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so I I thought that this is a, a an interesting way to follow up because I found your book to be very inspiring. Uh, <laughs> I've already written a book before, but there are 
having read it, I feel more comfortable writing about those things. And also, uh, there was on page 65, because I really like Anna for me, uh, she says, if I asked her where to sit down in her house, she laughs and says, Lord have mercy, move whatever you want to, child. You belong any place you want to be. And my favorite quote by Maya Angelou is, tattooed on my arm, you only are free when you realize you belong no place, you belong every place, no place at all, the price highest of reward is free. So I'm curious, is that a direct quote by the contemporary <laughs> was so much inspired by, uh, you know, I mean, she was a Quaker and all, so who knows if that's good history. So that was a direct quote to the best of my memory and the notes that I made of her. Um, I was aware as I wrote it that it had, it's not a direct quote from, I mean, yours is a direct quote from Maya Angelou, but um, Bernice did not speak exactly uh, like Maya did, but that the concept uh, when she was saying it was really literally like, you can, anywhere in this house is yours, you know, there's no, like, it doesn't matter where things are, move them and, and be whoever you want to be. Um, she I probably just meant it like that. And my choice, um, and with anyone who's writing something, you know, it's really what you leave out because she obviously said many things. Um, that idea that we could belong anywhere at her home was truly liberating for me. I think it was liberating because that concept that my Angela speaks of is a very liberating concept. So I was aware of the parallels of that, um, but I tried to, to write it in a way that it could be read just entirely literally. Um, but then also that it was opening the doors to that being possible in my life. And I certainly feel that it has been mostly true in my life. I don't think that I have mastered that, but I think that the, I, to know that, um, well, I don't want to get too philosophical in terms of, um, whether or not I've lived like, I mean, Maya Angela, I think has exemplified that very, very well. Um, but she was certainly an inspiration to my aunt Bernice was an inspiration and she might've read my Angela, by the way, you know, right. But, um, wow, I wonder how close in age they would be. That's an interesting thing too. Um, I hadn't even thought about that. Uh, so I'm not sure. Did I answer your question? Okay. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yes. Okay. I think we have one last one. Um, was there a difference between boys and others who joined as converts versus those who were born in and raised in the cult? Yes, definitely. Definitely. Um, the, the boys that, that came there, first of all, most of the boys that ever went to the organization and went to the field did not stay. And many of them only stayed very short amounts of time. They might have stayed two weeks. They might have stayed six months. They might have stayed five years. But unless you really went into the leadership program, you weren't really fully indoctrinated into the cult. Mm. So um, I had the opportunity to, to talk to many, not when I was young, I didn't, but later, um, men who had, were boys there. And their experience altogether was very different than the girls' experience at the field. I was um, born there, so I never made the choice to go. And I think most of the girls who were there really didn't choose to go there either. They were family members of the boys who were there. But the boys themselves, especially if they were athletic or, or um, in, in some way really good at what the field wanted, were groomed and given special privileges and really had a sense of home. And mm. so even though I knew a lot of I knew the boys growing up, I didn't know their experience because I was held separate from that. And I just don't think that you can really compare to an extent what happens if you have an actual family. And even if that family backs away and lets you be there, um, they don't see necessarily what's happening. But in your early, in the early years, the boys would go home to their families. Eventually they stopped going home because they were older, but, um, they had a lot more, comfort in their lives, even when they were being tested at the organization, than those of us who were born there. And there really weren't that many of us that were born there, certainly not people my age, mm. um, because my sister was the very old, first person um, born at the cult. And I was the fourth because it mm. was, even though my sister and I are exactly a year apart, there are two girls born in between us. And so there was four of us in one year. And then there was, you know, many right after that, but we were raised collectively. And, um, I think that we had to be kind of like, you know, when you hear PKs, preacher's kids, LKs were really held to a very high standard because we were supposed to be an example. Mm. 
mm. of what it was like to um, be truly righteous. And we were also considered almost aristocracy to the extent that, you know, we were going to inherit the keys of kings of the keys of the kingdom, and that that wasn't really debatable. That was just expected. Mm. So I could talk a lot about that, but. <laughs> You know what? I don't know what time it is. I left my phone up there. How we? It's seven now. Okay. Sorry. So I get the last question. Is that all right? Who is going to play you in the movie? <laughs> well, I don't know the answer to that, but um, we are in negotiations, which should be resolved by this Friday. Um, I am. I am doing the screenplay with, wow. uh, yeah, at least I'm the lead writer and I'm working with um, an actor. We're going to go public probably in the next two weeks. Um, he's flying out. I can't give any names today, but um, we are in um, negotiations. We probably will produce in about three or four years, um, like by the time it comes out. Um, but we've already, um, he's already put together a team of actors and I, I'm not allowed to say more right now, but it moved. it's moved very quickly. All so. right. Well, you've left us on a cliffhanger here. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.